one of the most important criteria we used to select the strains was, again, if they're going to affect embryonic development. Welcome, everyone, to the another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Wamsley, today, and we are joined by Dr. Mary Ann Amalaraju. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Mary Ann. How are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm excited to talk about some of your work that you've been, um, been doing here recently. Sure. But first... I want to, let's introduce you, I guess, a little bit of background. So you are currently an associate professor at University of Connecticut in the animal science department there. And you've been there um, for how long? This is my 10th year. Wow. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it flies when you're having fun and when you're working with birds, right, that are flightless mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, very. Um, so uh, a little bit to get to know you. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of this or that questions and you tell me what your preference is. OK, sure. All right. Mountain or beach? If there's snow, then it's mountain. <laughs> I agree with you. Um, fried or grilled chicken? Fried. <laughs> Wait, are you sure you're at University of Connecticut and not, and not at Mississippi State? <laughs> you're just a Southern girl at heart. <laughs> um, aisle or window seat? Aisle. And then crunchy or soft taco? Soft. Okay. Uh, we're, we're pretty compatible, I feel like, Mary. <laughs> All right. So now, most important question. What poultry professional or poultry nutritionist would you take with you in a zombie apocalypse and why? Oh, uh, okay. So I'm going to say Dr. Michael Derry. Okay. Um, so um, he passed away in 2021. But um, during my grad school, I never did anything with poultry. Right, but once I started setting up my independent research program, uh, it was Mike who brought me to the dark side, so. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think he would be pretty good in a zombie apocalypse, you know. Um, oh, he would, yeah. He was, he was a great, great man and great researcher. Um, I know we've we got to know each other through multi-state group and, and that's how I met Mike too. And um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really great group. But um, very cool. Well, so let's get into your research, okay? Sure. So you've been doing some work with probiotics, um, some lactobacillus species, right? Can you tell us a little bit about kind of selection of the species and then what your first steps kind of getting your feet wet were? Sure. So like I mentioned, I did it. Well, I work with poultry in a sense, food safety, right? That's what I'm trained in, not the production aspect of it. So that's where the story started. Okay. Uh, we're trying, as always, when you talk about poultry uh, safety, it is salmonella, right? We're trying to get rid of salmonella. <laughs> so we had um, around 30 different um, strains, species of lactobacillus that we were screening. So our goal was... Um, to reduce salmonella positivity in um, hatching eggs, right? So that we reduce the number of cedar birds that get into the grow-out farms. So we're right. trying to do it. So one of the uh, first projects I did when I started here is at UConn was trying to figure out what I can do and how I can apply them to hatching eggs. Uh, so when we were doing this experiment and screening them, um, so one of the... Uh, things we observed, right? Besides them being able to control salmonella, that the embryos were bigger. So that's where the story with the production mm -hmm. aspect of when my research on production uh, started with. Oh, that's cool. So, I mean, it's, it is really interesting that, you know, sometimes the greatest research comes about from one of those things where it's like, you know, that wasn't even the goal at all, but this is what we found out. So exactly. that, that's really cool to, um, and especially with me kind of looking into your research, but not knowing that background beforehand, um, that makes it even cooler too. But um, so you've made it into, so you're applying bacteria essentially to an egg which is like 
that's not what you're supposed to do, right? Because you're doing everything to try to get bacteria out of the egg and keep it as clean as possible. Yeah. <laughs> but kind of tell me about like the, the thought process, I guess, going into spraying it on the eggs and um, kind of figuring out dosage and um, the, how long you have to spray it for to be able to get some of these results. So when we looked at, when, when I just started scratching the surface on this, so we uh, read a lot about in ovo techniques. That's, you know, that, that's not new, right? Sure. Probiotics have been supplemented to developing embryos, but later during incubation, right? And most of them are inoculations. Yep. Because in ovo inoculation is a common method for vaccination, right? So my goal was to, was to use something that's user friendly. Okay. Right? Easy uh, spraying. It's very simple. You don't need uh, specialized equipment. You don't need sure. any training, right? So that was the reason for using spraying, not yeah. inoculations. Um, so that was why we did spraying. And then um, one of the challenges with probiotics, whether you apply them to the eggs or you're applying them in feed, is their survival. Yeah. Right? So how many of them can survive or how long can they survive? So they, they reach insignificant numbers so you can see an effect. Yeah. So, uh, so we did a lot of spraying trials to figure out what is the initial load I would have to spray so that I can have sufficient numbers. So that was how we figured out um, the dose yeah. that we spray. Um, and then I forget your next question. <laughs> um, so then it's kind of, um, I mean, I kind of forget it too, but I think the next part was just kind of how you got into, um, well, one, I mean, whenever you're introducing something into the into the incubation um, process or introducing bacteria, you've got to be concerned about hatchability, right? And chick quality. Yeah. Um, so your first study was to kind of figure out what could, what could last on the, what dosage could last and which ones were most promising in yes. um, improving the chick size initially. Right. Yes. And then going in to look at hatchability. Mm hmm. And then you went in and then started looking at muscle fibers um, from breast muscle, right? Yeah. So one of the, well, one of the most important criteria we used to select the strains was, again, if they're going to affect embryonic development, if there's going to be early embryonic death, late embryonic death. Forget it. Yes. Forget it. <laughs> yeah. That, there is no point in doing it. Right. So that was uh, one of the biggest criteria that we used. And then we landed up from the 30 we came down to 10 that were really effective against salmonella, whatever. So from the 10, then we narrowed down to two, right? Um, so yeah, so for broilers, right, the most important thing is muscle production meat, Yeah. right? So when we um, looked at our initial data, so we looked at um, breast muscle, right? So uh, yes, we did breast muscle weights and embryos. Uh, yes, it was. Yes, not that my students were using tiny little exacto knives. Like yes, yes, we actually used tweezers. So not that my student wanted to do it, but you know, oh. I kind of told him he has to. In the do name it. of research, you must. Yeah. So, uh, so the reason we so we looked at embryo mass, uh, the yolk sac weight and the length and the bone thickness and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at breast muscle weight and what we saw that over time, uh, whatever you would count, the jelly-like material, whatever you count towards as breast in the developing embryo was bigger. Okay. Very cool. And that is why we said we're going to focus on the breast muscle and see, or focus on the muscle. Looks like there is an effect on the muscle. So let's focus on the muscle and see what's happening with the muscle. Ready for more sustainable poultry production? New data suggests that decreasing bacterial loads in feed using Termin 8 supports entric health, leading to improved performance. Gut health is more than a gut instinct. Learn more today at www.anatox.com. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking about your students going through and like dissecting the little <laughs> breast too. And yeah. then, I mean, that would be really tender, right? <laughs> It'd be delicious. Yes. Well, actually, we start with day 10. Oh, well, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> so they're not even, they're like jelly like. No, yeah, that's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> they're jelly like, but we have done it so many times now that we are kind of pros with dealing with it. But yes, initially, it was very difficult.
Well, Marianne, I guess that's all the time that we have for today, but maybe I can kind of get you to come back and then we'll record another episode and we can kind of talk a little bit more about um, kind of the next steps that you have in the grow out process and what you've looked into after the ha- using those probiotics in the hatchery. Of course, that'd be wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, Marianne. Really appreciate your time today. And um, thank you to all of our listeners. Uh, Again, this is the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. And Marianne and I will be signing off. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. Bye. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. And if you have a poultry nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it and share it with us, feel free to email the research link, uh, the paper where we can find it, or the abstract to hello at wisenetics.com. That's hello at wisenetics.com. And I look forward to hearing from you.